What we're going to do today is have a look at something that's very quickly changing in the Australian landscape, which is um, essentially where the money is available to support your research aspirations. And I'm going to talk you through um, some of the recent developments in terms of national and state priorities and in terms of government thinking that if you're well up on and are able to ask some really targeted questions today should give you a chance to really pursue research that you're passionate about. It's not about doing, um, looking for non-competitive funding and not competitive funding, but it's about developing a diversified funding portfolio that allows you to do what you're passionate about. But before we get into the details, I'd like to introduce the rest of my crew for today. Drew Evans, Grant Tompkinson, and Natalie Ford. What we're going to do today is, please just relax, chill. <laughs> um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to just start with a couple of just intro pieces. And we're going to go through, and each one of our panelists is going to share some insights. We're going to go through some case studies around how we, as individual researchers, have tapped into the non-competitive funding and then what we're going to do is we're going to help you workshop up a pitch, but I'll get back to that later, because it's all about the pitch, whether it's in written or verbal form. And to be honest, when you're going beyond competitive funding, it often shifts to being more about the verbal and the impression and the concept that you excite others with. So today, just some context. So if you look at the total amount of money the Australian federal government spends on research, and this was a bit of analysis done by our chief scientist Ian Chubb, it's something like $9.2 billion a year. And that's spread over 115 distinct line items in the federal budget. Now when you talk to researchers about where does research funding come from, the two agencies that always pop straight to mind are the ARC and the NHMRC, and of course they do. They're critically important competitive funding schemes that help researchers do the blue sky fundamental research and establish a career and a track record. But just look at the numbers. The total ARC annual budget is less than 800 million. The total NHMRC annual budget is less than 900 million. As a proportion of that 9.2 billion, it's relatively slim. And yet it's often the majority of our focus, what we think of as researchers. I think that is the motivation for today's event. How do you tap in to the rest of that 9.2 billion? Not saying you don't still play for this game, but if you know how to play for that game, you should have a better chance of building the research career you want. So, you know, it's pretty clear there's significant scope for supporting research from government itself beyond competitive funding sources. So let's just have a look at how you tap into it. How many of you have gone to the Chief Scientist's website and read about the nine new national priorities that were launched last month? Mm, some people didn't do their homework. <laughs> Please do, I've got the link there and you had it in the email as well. We've all, those of us who have been around a little while, have seen national priorities of various flavours. They've generally been tick boxes that you tick on an ARC grant. <laughs> They've generally been, can you say that your work is going to be about, you know, innovative technologies or advancing health or whatever the, the wording is. And if you look at the statistics, the majority of grants that go up through ARC and NHMRC have found a way to tick a box. That is not what this is about. This is something quite different. And in the, anyone who's involved in this workshop, one of the real insights I want to share with you is that this is a shift in federal government thinking about research. This is not funding agencies trying to say we want to be able to monitor the fraction of our activity under certain headings, which is what we had historically. This is around essentially the chief scientist taking a leadership stance and saying, we want to define critically important areas for Australia's economic and social and environmental future that might fall between the gaps if we didn't put focus on it. This is about having detail under each of these nine headings, which is not meant to be inclusive, which is meant to define somewhat narrower areas. And if you go to that website, you'll see that with varying degrees of success, the narratives under these nine headings articulate not an all-encompassing approach, for example, to health. 
not an all-encompassing approach to manufacturing, but the attempt to come from a group of experts that were consulted during the definition of these priorities in where the important gaps were. So have a look at them. So what's going to happen with these priorities? We will see in the future that the ARC will have them embedded in the funding rules. But the more significant thing is that the chief scientist is going to be marching around all government departments and saying, here's your total spend on research. Please account to me what proportion of that spend is to these national priorities. Now let's think about behaviour change. <laughs> what will that drive? What we want that to drive is better connectedness between our decision makers and our research base. We want our decision makers to be able to know where the experts in certain fields are and be able to reach out and, and commission research that is in the national interest. That's what we're looking to do. To be a cynic though, what can happen if we get this wrong is that the big four consulting firms will have a field day. Okay? Because often there's a bit of a gulf between our researchers and the decision makers. But that's also our opportunity. It's our opportunity to start to build that awareness of our research base, awareness of what our capacity and our interest is, and to build those relationships that will allow you to tap those research funding streams. And that's what my wonderful panel will tell you about in a moment. Okay, so beyond the national, I don't know how many of you have seen, there's been quite a lot of media around this over the last year, but the state's 10 economic priorities. Now, these are not research priorities per se, but what they are is essentially quite a firm commitment that I've seen in action through the Economic Development Board, for example, of the current state government to really making a change that will drive, drive our state's economic future. If there's research that you're doing that locks in with those, your chance of securing state support is significantly enhanced. And of course, if you can find ways that your research support is supported by both federal and state um, agendas, it might be different elements of your research pitched in different ways, that's a wonderful thing. So I would encourage you to have a look at those. Um, for those who are new to these 10 economic priorities, roughly half of them are sectors. You know, for example, premium of food and wine or energy and renewables. And the other half are essentially the ecosystem we need for that to flourish. So there will be some of you who can tap well into this. And I'd strongly encourage you to go for PRIF funding, for example, or other state support schemes. But as I'll talk about in my case study, not all state government supports competitive either. If you sit back and expect to see announcements of funding schemes, you'll see some. But you'll get much further if you build the relationships and get to understand the needs of government. Okay, one last thing before we dive into the case studies. Next week, we're expecting to see launched something that is the second dimension to ERA. So you'd all know ERA, Excellence in Research Australia. It's been in place for five or six years now, and it measures our universities and their capacity to do excellent research as judged by essentially academic metrics, citations, high impact papers, etc. Now, ERA has allowed us to see that Australia has some amazing research, and here in South Australia, we have some amazing research. But one thing that it hasn't explicitly encouraged is connection with industry, collaboration with industry, or with end users of any form. And I'd even go so far as to say that people trying to optimise an era return shouldn't encourage people to engage with industry because it really doesn't show there. Now, you could be cynical and say, well, you want to do it anyway because it gives you a chance to bring in funding that's not just the competitive, but I don't think that's enough. So I've been working, as have a number of other people, through the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering to develop this second dimension to ERA that measures industry engagement. And by industry, we mean any end user of your research product. It could be a government agency, it could be a company. So if you are doing strong engagement as measured by the dollars you're able to bring in from that end user, you'd now, instead of just getting the number, which is the old era, like an era four, era three, era five, you get a letter which says what quartile your industry engagement's in. So for example, if you get a 4A, that means, well, you've got a four under conventional era analysis, but you're in the top quartile for your discipline, and that's important because different disciplines have very different opportunities to tap into end users. 
you're in the top quartile for income. So this, I think, is interesting and I wanted you to be aware of it. South Australia has volunteered all three of our universities, or rather all three of our universities have agreed to participate in a trial of this metric. So your Deputy Vice-Chancellor, as your equivalent of me, will know what your two-dimensional score is in the next couple of months. This gives people a chance who are focused on engaging with industry a chance to, I guess, have that recognition and value placed by university senior management if that was felt to be lacking in the past. It's an interesting change and I wanted you to be aware of it. 